All right. Um, John, have you read this book? I can't quite make it out. What does it say? Spell of the Sensuous by David Abram. I've heard of it. I haven't read it. No. I I think I think you I think you'll you'll want to read this. I, uh, okay. I'll send passages to you. I think you would also find this very interesting, uh, um, Paul. I think we talked about it a little bit, but um, the final the final chapter he talks about kind of the epistemology of phenomenology um, and how we use it in a utilitarian sense. Um, and like the whole time, like I'm struggling with the way that he's setting up his claims a little bit. Like, I think there's a lot of insight here, but it's, it's, it's like, it's like listening to Peugeot for me. And, um, but it's like, I, I think I said this to you, but like, if you take, if you take Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology and you apply it to, to Christianity, um, Peugeot is, I mean, that's not everything that Peugeot is, but that's kind of, uh, seems to be one of the things that really um, is behind what he's doing. And then Abram is like really looking at indigenous ways of knowing and, and shamanism. And, um, and I struggle with the way that they set up their epistemologies in both cases, but, um, uh, but the ending chapter really helped me. And now I feel like I need to go back and reread the book with <laughs> the last chapter in mind. Um, but it's, uh, it's quite interesting. And I, I, I feel like there's a lot there and also it connects with your work. And there, uh, as I was reading the last chapter, it was talking about, um, it's talking about the problem with a way of knowing that doesn't put you in right relationship with the surrounding world. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, he's talking about, he's, he, he, the, the, the four P's would help a lot right here. Yeah. And then, and then we could, I think that like the central claim is something like, it, it's actually much more important to know, to, to have the participatory knowing that allows you to be in right relationship with the natural world and the surrounding community and with the self than to have the propositional knowledge that science allows you. I think that's at the center of his claim. And I would guess that's also kind of central to Peugeot's Claim, right that that the sensed experience of the world is more valuable to understand deeply um it's, it's, it's more it's more valuable to have that knowing right than to have the scientific knowing right um for our lived experience at least i would i would agree with that interpretation and i think the application to especially to perspectival and participatory knowing is I think is, is is correct. I mean, I was trying to bring that out, and it's also something I'm trying to figure out as I try to bring it out. <laughs> um, this notion of da'af and faith as this continuity of contact that affords right relationship, rather than the cognitive closure that brings conviction of truth, um, and that if you have to choose between the former and the latter, human beings should probably choose the former rather than the latter, because the latter is grounded in the former, and the former is conducive to wisdom and virtue in the way that the latter isn't. So if that made sense to you, I'm in agreement with that. However, that should not be interpreted, and perhaps this is one of the ways in which faith has been, I would propose, has been misinterpreted, that the participatory always trumps the propositional and gets to be an absolute authority over it. And I, I think it's clear that at least vast portions of the United States, as a Canadian looking on, um, that seems to be the notion of faith I hear advocated. Namely, um, I can believe in the face of evidence and argument and plausibility just because I have my faith. Um, and so I, I, uh, I agree with you. That's why I tried to state it very carefully, but I would want to, in, in increasing care, distinguish it from the claim that participatory as an absolute authority over the propositional. Um, so you have to be very, I mean, this, this is a bit of a, a bootstrapping question. You have to exercise wisdom um, as to when you're going to give priority to one over the other. And the, part of the problem that, that's part of the claim of the author of faith is you only get that wisdom insofar as you're already exercising the author. But that's the case for all the virtues. If you if you were totally lacking in honesty, I couldn't possibly teach it to you. 
and I couldn't possibly get you to care about it, right? The virtues always, and this was, I think this is behind Plato's notion of recollection. We always have to be, and this is the point connected to what I just said, we always have to be participating in the virtues if we're going to come to get increasing knowledge of the virtues. Um, they, they can't be known uh, in a subjectless manner that we are somehow separate from them. Um, now, I have one more thing to say and then I'd, I'd love to give the time over to Paul. I think all of this is very important. I, I've argued it at length and I'm willing to discuss this more. And I saw Paul not, nodding a lot with what I said. So that was comforting or at least reassuring. Um, but I'm also, I mean, I'm also increasingly, and this is something I'd like to talk to Jonathan directly about. Um, I mean, you know, there's been a huge movement called object-oriented ontology, uh, speculative realism, uh, two branches, one coming from Whitehead, one coming out of Parman, um, arguing against phenomenology as a grounding epistemology. And the core of the argument, we can get into more detail, but just to put the idea out there, is they're critical of what they call correlationism. They're critical of the idea that um, the only ontology that we admit into existence is the ontology that is correlated with us and our experience. And the idea is they have two, one slogan and then one statement. One slogan is we shouldn't, our experience shouldn't constitute half of ontology. That's, that's a really strange claim to make that this being as opposed to that diamond over there is somehow central to all, right? And then the other thing they say is if you're committed to realism, really committed to realizing and not some crypto idealism that the world is somehow to some significant degree independent of human minds, then there have to be relations between objects that are not mediated by human cognition that we do not necessarily have access to. Um, and this is, the, this is something like a bit, oh, they're too strong in this, I would say, but something like Kant's idea of the thing in itself. There's properties out there that we will never and can never have access to that help guarantee the realness of the thing. And therefore, for those two reasons, they think phenomenology is actually ultimately inadequate uh, for getting us, and here's the key term, into the right relationship uh, with reality as reality. So I wanted to comment on both those. I wanted to think, I wanted to say what the connection was, Ray, between what you said and what I think the off is and distinguish it from uh, what I think is a misinterpretation of faith. And then maybe there's some link, I'm, I'm intuiting there might be this idea, increasing criticism as phenomenology, uh, as the grounding of all epistemology. So. I was, I was struck because I, I thought this was an offhand comment before we started our official conversation. <laughs> it feels like we've, 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 we've blown something up that could take quite a long time to through actually. So I guess, I guess we're off and running. Um, but the first thing I want to do is just for the for the audience, um, da'ath, is that the he Hebrew term for faith? Or? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's how I've heard it pronounced, but I, I make no claims to knowing how to speak Hebrew properly. It's written D-A, an apostrophe, and then A-T-H. A -T -H. I got it from uh, Cynthia Bourgeau in her book on the wisdom way of knowing and the wisdom of Jesus. Um, she's a a Christian theologian minister in the United States. And she writes quite a bit about the wisdom tradition with respect to Jesus. Okay, yeah, so I just, I, um, with our last conversation that went live, John, I know some folks were struggling with some of the, the language. So I wanna, um, you know, for folks who are watching this on my channel, I wanna be a little bit conscious of like, making sure we ground the language for people. But- One, um, one thing you, got, you guys should know is that uh, the, the, first, the first book, of the first half of Awakening from the Meaning Crisis is almost done. And in it, at the end of it, is a 50-page glossary with all the terms defined <laughs> and interrelated and organized. Okay. Uh, I'm excited. And then the second book will have this uh, an even more extended, right? Um, so, yeah, that's there's there will very soon be an actual aid for people for all of this. <laughs> As Paul calls it, the verveki words. Um, the, the fancy verveki words, as some of the yeah. people in my community call it. <laughs> so we could we could have a whole book. Just you could just publish that verveki words. Um, <laughs> so so the off your. I, I just want to ground back to that for a second, if we could, because I think what you what you often do is kind of bring back an older term or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feel it captures something. It is not captured by 
um, by the, the modern version. That when we say faith now, it's loaded with something that da um, isn't necessarily loaded the same way or expands and has, has a greater power. Like you've done this, you know, you talk about this with philosophia or deologos, that, that by, by using these older terms, we have now this power to kind of re-examine the way that we look at it. You know, I will, I'll bring it back to David Abram for a second um, here because, you know, one of his, the, the second to last chapter is called the, the forgetting and remembering of air. And one of his claims is that in, you know, in indigenous traditions and in the Jewish tradition, if you look at the Old Testament version of it, there is this sense that the spiritual is, is literally the wind, right? The wind and the atmosphere are continuous with spirit and that pneuma and prana and psyche and all these things. And he talks about the Navajo tradition that we are born, that, that, that we have the winds enter us and it starts with the wind. And it's quite an interesting argument he makes, but, but I thought it was, I, I, we can, that'll have to wait. Um, but the big thing that I was pointing out there is just that when we use the term psyche, right, versus, you know, if we, if we go back to these terms and we re-examine them, we get a chance to, to play with them in a different way. So I just wanted to, to, to ask you to, to illustrate a little bit more um, what is captured for you by using right. the author rather than faith. So for me, I mean, so faith has been rendered a synonym with belief. Um, and people use those interchangeably. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. Um, and it's often understood as belief without, um, you know, relevant argumentation or empirical evidence. Um, and the off doesn't, doesn't sit there. I mean, Paul will correct me if I'm wrong, but the, I mean, Bourgeois claims that the auth goes ultimately back to something like sexual intercourse or its etymology that's making love. Um, I believe there's was all the begin like when Adam knew his wife, that's actually uh, the auth. That's yeah, like that. that's yada oh, in Hebrew. So it's to know. Right. So that's that's kind of where I was a little confused with this. So, but keep going. It's well, that's what she, she claims that they're etym etymologically related. So um, I'm I'm not I'm not sure if that's the case. Um, so, uh, but th the point is, that's what I'm trying to invoke anyways, whether or not the etymology is correct and, and she's right or wrong. Uh, what she was trying to point is that the, the sense of uh, the faith relationship, having a, uh, this sense of sexual intercourse is pervasive through the Bible. She talks about who Jesus is the bridegroom of the church and all that uh, sexual imagery is used. So whether or not the actual etymology is correct, uh, I'm glad to know that it, it's off. Uh, although maybe they're related, I'm not sure. What I was trying to pick up on is this idea of, of using knowing and, and, and sexual intercourse, almost like the way uh, uh, noumena, right, is, is breath and spirit. Uh, and then that, like, so when you're, when you're making love with somebody, you're not primarily forming theoretical beliefs about them. I guess that's what I'm trying to point to. Although right? some do occur. Yes, yeah, some do occur, <laughs> right? Some do occur, uh, but that's not primarily what so we talk about we're after something called intimacy, which is a term we invoke. And then the and then I'm trying to get at, well, what does intimacy mean? Intimacy doesn't mean identity. You don't become completely fused with the other person, although we sometimes use that language. Um, intimacy is this idea of continuity of contact. And I think that's also picked up in the covenantal relationship that Israel has with God. And that's often also expressed in sexual terms. Israel is sometimes accused of whoring after prostitutes, right? And so, um, uh, so uh, I, again, I think, I think that the, the, the symbolism is, is clear. And so the, the idea that I was trying to point to is in participatory knowing, what we're trying to do is maintain a continuity of contact so that we so that it affords a right relationship with someone. And that's of course what's happening when you're making love with somebody as opposed to just having sex with them. Part of the point is you're right in, in this intensification of a continuity, reciprocal opening so that you get into right relationship. Doesn't mean that you've come to a, a stable final set of beliefs about the person. Um, in fact, typically when you really love somebody you'll find that some of your deepest beliefs about them get challenged at some point um, precisely because you are in love with them. Um, and, uh, uh, and so 
I was trying to say that what's going on in that sense of faith is that we are trying to not get a cognitive closure, not try to get right the now I have the complete account or the finished account or the final truths that bring a, se a, a sense of, of sort of conviction of truth. You're going to have conviction of truth. I'm not denying that. But the thing we should face epistemologically, sorry, this is a long thing, is that most of the things that we have believed to be true, this is called Loudon's you know, inductive pessimism argument, right? They turn out to be false. And so, right, and it, so what did, was science just all a waste? Look, all we've had is false after false after false. Well, most people are now saying, well, it wasn't that, that, that science was a waste because all it's done is accumulated, but is that we've gotten a more and more intimate, right, connection to reality. We're getting better at better at orienting to reality epistemologically. And so even in the heart of propositional knowing, I see a sometimes or mostly cryptic reference to participatory knowing. Well, we're getting into the right relationship with reality and we're maintaining continuity of contact. That's why I said, I think that notion of faith as continuity of contact for right relationship is primary because you find it grounding and even at the core of propositional knowing when people are honest about the history of propositional theorizing. But then I said, sorry, you asked me to explain, so I got, I'm trying to unpack it a little. Then I said, but I don't think that's equivalent to identifying Doth with belief or giving propositional assertions an absolute authority, sorry, giving yet that participatory knowing an absolute authority over your propositional knowings. Um, and this can lead to kind of a decadent romanticism or I just feel it or I just believe it where believe it doesn't mean belief. It means this sort of, I don't know what it is, this mental thrusting towards something. Um, and and, um, yeah. I mean, and that, that's, that's what I want to challenge. You describe it as this Cartesian, as a sort of Cartesian addiction to certainty playing out in the religious sphere. It's an addiction in that it's starving us of the, 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 the nutrition we need uh, other than, other than, um, you know, I, I, I don't mean metabolic nutrition, right? I mean, uh, the psychoontological nutrition I need, we're getting starved of that. And I think it, it's, it's also an addiction in the, in, in the sense that um, it, it can be tyrannical, it can be blinding of the other kinds of knowing and this alternative way uh, of, see the, the way I'm talking about, um, the, the, the way I'm trying to talk about Doth, faith, is, is oh, a way oh. that, that isn't, isn't, I want to make a distinction, and, and the words used to make a distinction, but they don't, there's a distinction between sort of assur assurance and certainty. Those aren't the same thing, right? I, I have assurance that my partner will, will, won't cheat on me. I, I don't have certainty of that. That doesn't make any sense. I can't prove it. I can't give you evidence. I can't give you an, an argument, but I have assurance because, right, I, 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 have, a, a, I have an ongoing sense an, of intimate, continuous contact. That's what I'm, and that's what I'm trying to pull apart. Wonderful. Um, Paul, I don't know if you're seeing it, but your screen turned green there for a second. Did you see that? I see. I'm I'm here with you, so I I see y'all fine. Your yeah. your 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 um your connection was a little wobbly for a little yeah. bit there, Ray. Paul didn't turn green for me. So. <laughs> okay, Paul. Let's I, I love I love everything that John said right there, and I think he is absolutely in keeping with my understanding of, and I think, uh, yeah, I think the word you're really looking for is faithfulness. Because yes, faithfulness, yes, yes. Yes, and better, better. I mean, because if you look at, especially, so so my tradition, because we're Protestants, there's a big emphasis right in that inflection point at the time of the Reformation, and in the inflection point, it's sort of nice to see. Um, you can see the beginnings of modernity, but you can also see the tail ends of pre-modernity, and you can see their their wrestling. And so, for example, in our tradition, we have something, we, we don't talk about certainty of salvation. That would be 
we talk about assurance of salvation. Mm. And mm. and wow. you know, while you, while you were talking, John, one of the, you know, I thought. Well, let, so I want. I was a little curious about the Greek and the Hebrew and pistis, yeah. and you know, also belief is you know in, in Greek it's pistis. So it's yeah, it's often trust. I used to play games with. I've always played games with people in Bible studies in church because it's fun. It's, it's probably trollish on my part, but every time every time the the New Testament would say faith, I would just insert trust, and then people would sort of get back for exactly that reason you're talking about, John. And so Rafe, I think the direction that this person is going is very much in keeping with my understanding of biblical fidelity. And, and I, think, I think part of the reason the propositional develops is that we, we, have to, we have to put things out there apart from ourselves in order to see them, in order to play with them, in order to process them. And, and the propositional, especially within the realm of modernity, is is powerful because it takes it outside the narrative and sort of mm. you know puts it up into what I call a monarchical vision. So the propositional is outside of history. It's static. It's in the world of things, and and that's a very powerful thing because we can act as if it's it's you know we can act as it's it as it's as if it's a form, as it were, and we can play with it. And, and so I think the propositional is also deeply functional when it comes to community, because we all have these different experiences in community. And in order to try to have at least something we have in common, a fixed point that we can all mm -hmm. find where each other is by way of reference, those propositional things are important. But I think part of what happens in in modernity and scientism is that the propositional gets pushed beyond what human beings can actually um, can, can actually do and and can actually see. And that's where I think I, I really liked what you what you said, John, and and what you were leaning to, I think, Rafe, in terms of this idea that you know the best we can really get is at, at is is faithfulness. And, and faith has this faithfulness and these systems that we make have this capacity and we need to hold them in a way that stretches us. And so we're having this experience right now, but we've got this thing out there. And, and one of the things that we do is we say, okay, I'm going to leverage this thing out there against my current, you know, kind of the tyranny of the now. And, and you do this all the time. You go to the doctor's office and you say, oh, doctor, I've got this going on. And the doctor says, yeah, 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 that's really this. He said, but that doesn't feel like this. This feels like this. But the doctor says, give it time and let's treat this. Sometimes the doctor's right. Sometimes the doctor's wrong. But so this dynamic between the things we sort of put out there and leverage against the now and the immediate are important, and I loved what uh, what also what you said, John, about this this tyranny of the of the human um, of the human systems. And I, I think you're I think it's absolutely consistent with at least what I see as the world that that you know religious communities like my own try to inherit against our present realm where yeah there's all sorts of relational relationality between lots of things apart from human beings that, that these are you know these are conversations that we have very little understanding of because we're not really a part of it but to act as if these things don't exist is that that's 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 just hubris and folly so i really enjoyed you know everything that john went into in that in that little section i thought it was it was really, really good. And, and again, I mean, even John's fancy verveki words, um, I mean, part of, I mean, part of why John has been so helpful to me is that he's taking these things from a cognitive science perspective and he's put new words on them. And I think the reason saying da'ath or, or pistis, or, I mean, the reason we sort of, and you see this all the time in religious language and preach, these are, these are common preacher tricks. You make it a little bit different 
And that adds then some dissonance because that dissonance is necessary to sort of shake people out of their present paradigm and allow them to see something else. And John's words have, you know, John's words have been that for me because of course, just like with learning a new language, first you do translation, but if you're learning a new language as an adult, at some point you realize that the translation doesn't really get you there and that you have to start to live into that new language and you start to inhabit that new language. And that's when you begin to notice these, these terms in the other language, let's say Dutch or Spanish um, or Frisian, these terms in the other language have meaning that you can't really appropriate in English. And so, but, but your relationship with those terms is direct. Because, you know, for in my case, when I, when I went to the Dominican Republic and I had to learn a new language and I had to live into another culture. So suddenly then, now I have all of these experiences. I'm dreaming in Spanish. Um, I'm, I have all of this direct encounter in this other world unmediated by English. And as long as English is mediating that world, I can't fully inhabit that other world. So I, I, I see all of this mapping onto those experiences and you know, I really appreciate what John laid out there. That, that last point you just said, Paul, is the one that I keep coming back to, especially around the topic of Gnosis, that, that living into another culture and you go from translating into Spanish to thinking in Spanish, whatever that's supposed to mean, right? And, 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 and of course, that's happening also like in anthropo anthropology. If you're going to get a good ethnography, you have to, you have, and that's the move. That's the move that I'm really interested in because for me, that's a much more da'ath understanding of what's called conversion than I replace one set of beliefs with another set of beliefs. Because, for example, you know, when I was, you know, when I'm reading Spinoza, I, I think I have a lot of correct beliefs about what he's saying. Those beliefs don't change, but then I got the ah, and I started seeing the world as Spinoza saw it. I started to live in that world. It became a viable option. And for me, that's a much better understanding of metanoia or, and, and conversion than a change of belief. Because you know what didn't really change? My beliefs. That wasn't the change. Tolstoy gets that. I've mentioned this before in the death of Ivan Illich. Ivan Illich always knew, always knew he was going to die the way you know that two plus two equals four. But today he knew he was going to die, right? We're talking about a fundamental change. And this is why I've been trying to unpack all these other things, perspectival knowing, and, and, and salience and, you know, uh, participatory knowing and affordance, trying to get at like what, what is actually happening in that metanoic change? Because I think this is what Rafe is on right now. Yep. Yep. And Rafe, I don't mean to diagnose you. You're my friend and I love you, right? I'm just, I'm trying to be helpful. I see you uh, is exactly making that move and trying to come to terms in both senses of the word, come to terms with it, right? Come to actual terms with it, right? Um, but, but, but modernity, right? The, the current paradigm isn't offering you much uh, for understanding this transformation that you are going with and you, that you're very bravely sharing with the world at large. And I commend you for that. And so I, I, I think that again, I, I hope I'm being a friend here. I don't want, I'm not, try, not treating you like a specimen. That that move, that metanoic move is the move that I see you like really shining in you and that you're trying to come to terms with. I, and I think that is conversion. And that's metanoia. I mean, that's the word that the church and the New Testament <laughs> use. And I think part of our problem, and we've had this problem for a long time, is that these tools that we have that we're using right now, and I don't even just mean Zoom, I mean language. Yeah. yeah. These tools we're using right now are enormously powerful and they're enormously helpful. And they're in some ways a, a real key to our success, but they are insufficient to actually, uh, I mean, as a preacher, this is what I live because my job is to provoke metanoia in people, but the tool I use is the speech I'm using right now. And also what I see, Rafe, what you do with your parkour, um, this, and, and I think other, if you look at the work of, uh, I was, you know, Drew Johnson and another guy, they were 
you know, that they had the experience of, so they were looking at, okay, so the, the Bible records all these words, okay? And, but if you really wanted to, let's say, recreate ancient Hebrew, let's say, sacrificial practice, even with all little details in the Bible, you could never do it. And a, a, a surgeon was Drew Johnson. He teaches in, he's a Hebrew scholar in, in New York. He was talking to a surgeon and he said, you know, to a degree, part of when I look at, so then they went and visited somebody doing a sacrifice. He said, you know, a lot of this is not unlike surgeons heading in for surgery with their washing of the hands. I mean, we've seen that on videos. And, you know, again, you can, we, we always try to, relate these things but they never get there and so i love the line that you said i mean the problem with the way of knowing that doesn't put you in right relationship with the surrounding world and of course in christian terminology the goal of the church the faith and again that's a that's an extrapolated use but the goal of you don't you don't even really find the faith that's used once or twice in that way in the bible it's almost never used that way the goal of this is, in fact, of course, right relationship, not only with the world, but with the God and, you know, the relationship between the world and the God. I mean, that's a whole nother conversation, but that's that's very much what the goal is. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm struck by the idea. I mean, frame phrases that are coming into my mind is one, you know, he was perfect in his generations, right? Speaking of Moses, and this is capturing this idea of right relationship. But also, I'm struck by the the um, by Buddhism, right? And what is at the center of Buddhism, right? Is is also this idea of of right relationship, right? How do I um, how do uh, I'm struggling here for uh, John? Help me. I'm I can't call up uh, you know the, the noble truths and and the um. You you want to overcome dukkha, right? You want to overcome the loss of agency. Mm -hmm. You want to restore agency. Uh, and, and make it as full as possible, where agency is that ultimately the capacity for entering in consistently, reliably entering into right relationship uh, with reality, yes. And, and part of that is right thought, right action. Oh, the Eightfold Path, yes. Yeah, and the right there is more like dexterity than it is, uh, you know, truth. So yeah, I was just struck by that. And now, now that we're in this conversation, okay. I really want you guys to read be this care, book. Be careful what you lead off with if you want to play <laughs> in the conversation. Um, yes, um, because this this book, now that I've finished it, it was quite a struggle for me to read it um, because I was struggling with the, the you know his underlying epistemology, right? The whole way through. Um, and, but now that I've finished it, it's like, it feels so at the center of the conversation that we're having because ultimately he's talking about a lot of this idea of recovering the embodied experience of the world and ourselves as in relationship to this broader ecology, which is at the center of how the physical practice to me is, is so important in actually getting mm, this right relationship, you know, that we're looking for in spirituality and that we have to have that. And, and, it's interesting because he's talking a lot about indigenous people, but he also talks a lot about the Hebrew Bible, right? And how there's a lot about the way that the Hebrews and the Greeks, you know, it, he, he has uh, he has some some critique for your friend Plato, uh, John. Um, but of the central thesis of that book is that it's alphabetic. So that that one what he examines is the potential impact of an alphabet of a phonetic writing system and how it it allows us to essentially become propositional in the way that we think by, by disconnecting the symbolism that we use for our language from the natural world, right? Because, and he, he traces it from, you know, essentially you have cuneiform and hieroglyphics, which are pictographic. And so the way that we represent speech is always in relationship to the sensory experience of the world. And then it goes into the, the Phoenician alphabet, the Semitic alphabet, which, um, which is still like the, the A, right? When we look at an A, the, the Hebrew term for that is Aleph, which is ox. And 
the way that we have it has been rotated 180 degrees from the way that it was built. And so you can see that it is an ox originally, right? Mm -hmm. And B is Beth, it's house, right? So it has this in its original form. And then when it is translated to Greek, it's lost. Hmm. And then the other argument they makes is that, um, is that there's something very profound that happens when vowels are added, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you don't have vowels, the basic idea is that the breath is sacred, right? And the breathed portion of a word is, is, is what represents that, right? We still have this sense of the breath is sacred. And once we have vowels and we can just symbolize it, it's like we forget. We forget that the breath is what gives life to the word the way that it gives life to us. It's the way that we are part of this whole breathing system of living things. And so in this, 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 this conversation we're having, it seems like it's, it's, it's got a lot of interesting insights that connect to what, you know, the strange reason that I'm in a conversation with you guys that seems to have something to do with spirituality. I mean, <laughs> you know, I feel like you're accusing me of converting, um, <laughs> of being in the middle of a conversion, John, which is, which is funny, right? I hope um, we all are. Yeah, there we go. In the middle of a conversion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I didn't, I was worried it was coming across as an accusation. I, I was trying know. to... <laughs> It's fine. It's it's just a funny thing for me to to recognize. Like you said to me once that, you know, you yeah. thought it was built as a church, and that's a yeah. It's a profoundly um, it's a profoundly uh, there's something terrifying about that idea. Well, maybe there's a little bit of the imp of Socrates in me about stuff like that. I mean, I was trying to capture. You have on several occasions, and some of them in my presence talked about moving from a self-description as an atheist to non-theist to non-theist Christian yeah. uh, and that uh, and that and that isn't so much that you've been convinced about a particular supernatural metaphysics but that you find yourself to use Paul's language living into a new world living into a new way of being and, and I find that I mean I that's what I that's where I talk about this other Greek word for knowing Gnosis that this kind of the knowing that is this metanoic, metanoetic movement um, that makes a way of being, a way of seeing possible that wasn't possible before. You know, and, and St. Paul talks about that, you know, now I see things and there's all this language about seeing things new and being new. And, and that's what I was trying to point to, that, you, you, that you've been on this journey. Um, like, I mean, I... I'm not converting to Christianity in a way that I would have recognized as a conversion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's part of what I was trying to sort of, I guess I was being a bit provocative, but hopefully in a helpful way. Um, I was trying to get to notice that um, that term is, it's, is, is, it's also part of this constellation of terms that perhaps we're discussing uh, the, the renegotiation. I'm very interested in the connection between what we're doing right here and Gnosis, how we can get into a form of communication and communing, where communing is the participatory intimacy, not just the communication of propositions, such that the logos takes shape. We don't make it, it takes shape, right? And that taking shape, to me, is an especially powerful tutor affordance into right, into Gnosis, into this, um, you know, Chris and I talked about that in the, in the anthology that Paul contributed to, right, um, that, that there, and, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in how those two come together, and so I, 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 I see the ongoing dialogues you're having, and the dialogos running through them, and your metanoia, and the emergence of Gnosis, all constellating together, and I, I and I'm trying to. Well, I'm trying to understand it, and I don't mean as a specimen. I, I want to understand it because I, I identify with it. And I'm also trying to, hopefully, reflect it back to you, so that you can uh, come to uh, a more, and I mean this in the positive sense, a more critical understanding of what's happening for you. I, I, I like Rafe, your 
So if I were to use, let's say, C.S. Lewis's, uh, some of his framework from his book, Miracles, um, Rafe, your direction has been, so nature, according to Lewis in Miracles, is our sister. And, and part of what we, we turn to nature, we turn to our sister in order to know the father of both us and our sister. And it's, it's in that sense that word is, um, na nature doesn't have with, nature has word beneath her, but not in her like we do. And, and it's that sense that in terms of a biblical cosmology, you know, the book of Hebrews says, you've made us a little lower than the angels. Well, what on earth does that mean? Um, we, we somehow have this, we are both sisters with nature. We are the stuff of earth and the breath of God. I mean, all of this, all of these, he, this Hebrew imagery, you know, begins to say, okay, so if we really, if we're, I mean, basically the Bible says, we are, we're rebellious and we're confused as to, in fact, what our nature is. We don't know what we are. And we can look at our sister and we can turn to our sister and we can learn a lot about ourselves from our sister, but it's not actually our sister alone that will finally fully satisfy us. What we really want is reunion with the father. And I don't know if any of that is helpful at all, but I see that in your work, Rafe, because you do a lot of turning to the sister. But at the same time, let's give Plato his due. And because what Plato and what Plato launches is, is a lot of also, I think, suspicions that we have a father. And how can we how can we get to know our father? And of course, Aristotle comes around and says, yeah, but don't forget um, the work of the father because that's in many ways how we do know the father. So I see that as your work. And I think what all of us want, and, and John, this is where I really appreciate your work because I get so frustrated when I hear people say things like, well, we all want to know the truth, but that's all sort of trapped in that, in that prison that we were talking about earlier. And I much prefer, we want right relationship with, I'd say not only the sur surrounding world, but, but all, of, all, of the, all of this thing that we are within and a part of. We want right relationship with all that we are in fact in relationship with. And, and that's what the metanoia is about that we are now suddenly um, we have a, a metanoia, we have a changed mind, we have a change, you know, and, and we are now in right relationship. And that, that to me, again, when I look at Christianity, that's the goal of Christianity, right relationship. And in fact, that relationship in, in the Christian narrative passes through death, but not out of physicality, but finally finds its goal in what we're all looking for and longing for now. I think that's a, that's a fair way to restate a lot of what the Apostle Paul says in many of his epistles, I think within the framework of what we're discussing here. So it's interesting. I, um, so Paul and I have not published our most recent conversation, but the end of it is a, is a, is a, is a deep dive into the idea of the divine feminine and how that plays out within Christianity versus other things. And this is where, you know, the, the, the Christianity that I, I see is not quite satisfactory to me because, because for me, um, it seems that the, the full respect for nature is not there, right? Because in, in, um, you know, in Peterson's terminology, you have the divine, you know, the, 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 the divine mother, and the divine father and they're co-equal and they equally have a negative and a positive valence right this is the way we're psychologically set up and i see this you know he tracks that back to to say mesopotamian myth where you have where you have tiamat and apsu right and tiamat is the mother goddess and she's also the destructive flood that shows up in the bible 
right? The term for the flood that's used in the Bible is etymologically der derived from the name of Tiamat. Um, and that to me describes reality really well, right? Nature is outside of us and it is it gives birth to us and it is terrifying and destructive to us. And it is also the thing that, that, that everything has come from. And I see that also in, in the Tao Te Ching. Like I, the first stanza of the Tao Te Ching, I think is one of the most profound things that has ever been written, right? The way that can be named is not the eternal way. Like how, how much is that resonant of the themes that we've been describing here? The models that we have are always insufficient to the underlying reality, to the thing itself. And then the second stanza, or the second, uh, second verse in that stanza is, the nameless is the mother of all things, mm -hmm. right? And to me, that's, that's, that's the potential of nature. That's the thing that is, that's always, always outside of us. And then the named gives rise to the 10,000 things. It is when we use articulated speech and our capacity, our logos, that things come out of potential and into being. And that's how I read that, right? And I think that when we, when we place the named above the nameless, we we are, we're actually, um, I think that takes us out of right relationship with the natural world, right? I think that's a dangerous move. So I think that to engage in right relationship with the world, I need to have as my highest principle, agape and logos in relationship. Um, so I do see that as at the top of the hierarchy, but I also see, I also see, I also, I, I always feel like whatever I can describe is insufficient, right? So if I say this is my highest principle, that's, that's, that's good and it's worth a while. And I also need to remember that it's always not the actual way, right? that the way is always beyond what I could say, always beyond what I could comprehend. Um, but you I don't mean, want to give in to, you know, it, there's always, that's always intention. It's, and I, I like John, your moreness and suchness in there. Yeah, there yeah. There's always both in there. There's always moreness, but there is always suchness. And it's because if you lose both, you, well, then, then it's just, well, we skepticism, we don't know. Or, and I think that that resists then the, I, I think, John, part of what I hear you resisting, which is sort of, well, here it is. Well, here it is. And, and I think a big part of people's, pe people's very, their, un, their understandable disappointment with the church is that especially in, in the, the American consumerist uh, the, the American consumerist package, Christians for a couple of generations now have basically been saying, well, here it is. And then people are like, oh, okay. And then they start getting into it. And it's like, really? This, 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 this is what you're selling? I'm, <laughs> I'm not impressed. And that in, in light of, you know, a whole range of a whole range of tools and experiences. And, you know, there's over the last 50, 60 years, 70 years now, there's just been a flood. I mean, this is what pluralism has done. There's just a flood of new options for people to, to work through these things. And against that, you've kind of got, you know, the church standing around selling soap, which is, Hey, work for Tyler Durden. <laughs> well, <laughs> the the uh, the you know the Jehovah's Witnesses the the if you look at if you look at the history of the Jehovah's Witness Church their their entire and, and they've been very successful in many ways but their entire evangelistic program was basically Fuller soap that that that's they they took the Fuller soap practices and just started using it for their particular you know, their particular group and it works, but um, if, if, if there's no moreness and it's all just suchness, well, then you live and die with that suchness. The, uh, 
the marketing techniques, of course, were ultimately derived from Renaissance magical practices, uh, which makes it even more, more of a weird circle the way it's wow. come out historically. Um, so, so Rafe, I, I mean, I, you guys both know, so this I'm not like, oh, shocking, right? Like I, I, I'm, I'm, and Paul, you invoked it, so right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with, uh, with pluralism uh, about this, and I've constantly made that argument. That came up, Paul, in our last discussion with, with JP. Um, you know, we're comparing, you know, uh, incarnation and enlightenment, which I thought was. Uh, I, I found that a, a true instance of dialogos. I felt that everybody was moving to places they couldn't get to on their own. Um, and so there's that. And, um, and, and like you, Rafe, I'm, I'm deeply impressed by the profound transformative wisdom and I, I, what I would call da'ath that I found within Taoist practice and text. And they should always be paired together. The text without the practice is fairly blind and uh, the practice no, is fairly, fairly powerless is what I should say. And the practice about the text is fairly blind, right? Um, and, and same thing with Buddhism, and and especially for me with Neoplatonism, which has been invoked. Plato has been invoked. Um, so I, I'm I'm in sympathy with all of that, and and I, we want to rehash it. We can, but I don't need to. That's sort of the basis for why I take up a stance of non-theism. Uh, uh, so, and, and I mean, and I mean this as a genuine question. I'm not trying to sort of trap or wedge. I really, this is an open question. Given all of that, why is the la why is the noun that all the adjectives are modif modifying Christian? That you're a, a non-theistic Christian, yeah, yeah. So what? I, again, I'm not. I I, I want to. My the reason for asking this, I want to be really clear that there's no secret agenda. I want to get like something is drawing you, something is inducing you, something is leading to metanoia such that you feel the right way to enter into the right relationship with that is with this particular, you know, let's grant it controversial laden term, but nevertheless, it's a particular term, Christian. I'm trying to ask this question as open as I possibly can. I'm not trying to pin you or trap you. There's, there's no jujitsu going on here. I'm very happy to try and answer it. And uh, yeah. um, I feel like there's lots of layers that could get unpacked and I hope that they will be useful for, 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 for different layers. But, you know, Peugeot says uh, we have to live within a story. Right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is you know, where, where, where my, my perspective tends to align more with Peterson or Peugeot in some sense than with yours because- Yeah, I get that. Narrative a little bit higher in the in the necessity of, of somebody orienting towards. <clears throat> so I think on one layer, layer it's like um, that's that's the story, right? It's the story that that it's the story that I understand on some level, and I felt it transform me. Like I am deeply impressed by aspects of Taoism and aspects of Buddhism, but I don't feel like the story has been has 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 i mean it's not to say that it doesn't right right because i think about in some sense i think of, of jesus as a man who was willing to die for us and buddha as a man who was willing to live for us and i think those are both wonderful examples of the hero like the buddha had the chance to be enlightened and he chose to come back to the world and experience the suffering of the world right and that's that, that's the 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 archetype of the bodhisattva and i think that there's so much that we can gain from from being in relationship to the archetype of the bodhisattva as well as the archetype of christ right um <clears throat> but but in some sense the story for whatever reason maybe maybe i can i i'll, I'll try to get at why i think that reason might be but but i have i've simply been more compelled by the story and, and that's come against immense resistance because I grew up in a, um, in a counterculture community where Christianity is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and, and, I, and my experience of Christianity when I was young was of evangelical charismatic Christianity that was very anti-science. And then mm -hmm. I went to a place of being essentially a new atheist, right? Like, if 
you know, I sent you that article, The Godlessness That Failed, because I thought it was fascinating, because I think there's a whole generation of us who spent a lot of time on internet forums when they were first coming up, and who were, who were molded by this debate between the Christians and the atheists. Right, right, right. The, the atheism that, that we were, that like late Gen X, early millennials were, were so, um, so attached to seems to have simply collapsed and, and not worked, right? It's like Sam Harris is the last one. Like even Richard Dawkins seems to have his doubts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but like I remember at some sen- at some point, like the the f- the phrase "God so loved the world that he sacrificed his only son" just popped into my head and started popping up regularly. And I thought, mm. "Wow, mm. such an extraordinarily powerful idea." I don't know why, like symbolically, it moves me. Mm. And there's a there's a there's a song by Leonard Cohen, um, "Hallelujah," right? Of course, of course. A Canadian has to know Leonard Cohen. Come on. <laughs> that song was one of my favorite songs. And so then there's this, it was rewritten by a Christian rock band or something. And that, that version's not great. But there's this little girl from Ireland, Rogers, right? Um, who, who sings it, right? And it makes me cry every time that I listen to it. Absolutely moves me. So in some sense, the story moves me. Now, when I, uh, and, and so, you know, I really love Peterson's idea that we have to go back and rediscover the bones of our father and bring it forward. Sure. Sure. And this is part of what I think the counterculture got so wrong. And it's yep. something we're still fighting, which is people just don't recognize how powerful tradition is and how blind we as individuals really are to what constitutes the effective search for well-being right that when we try to simply reason our way to it it's it's not so easy and for better or worse the 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 culture that i'm embedded in its father is christianity is what it seems like to me right you know we paul and i get really deep into this 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 question of like does the enlightenment derive itself from christianity or is it sort of bubbling up from the ancient Greek and Roman um, thing with, you know, in resistance to Christianity. Um, I'd, say, I'd say both. Okay. <laughs> both perhaps. Um, so, so there's something about, about, about just needing to tackle it, needing to understand it because, you know, why does, what the Lord of the Rings is like the most in, in many senses is like my Bible, right? It's the thing that transformed me as a child and set me on my life path. And it's loved by counterculture people, but it's actually a profoundly Christian story. And people don't understand it and don't understand the underlying grammar of it because they don't understand Christianity and they don't know the Bible and they don't know what it's in reference to. And so part of this is just like, well, I have to understand Christianity because it's where, it's where the West comes from. And I think as much as we, as, as much as many people now feel like the West is, is corrupt and destructive and terrible, I think we really underrate how great it has been and how much it has to donate to a positive future. And in order to understand that, I think you have to understand Christianity. So that's all of it. And then this last thing is like, I talked to to Paul about this and I've sent you a message about this as well, but it's like, um, I don't know that I'm a Christian, right? Um, It's not a statement of like, Like when I said that to you, that I think I'm a non-Christian, the I think part was really important for me. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Because it was a question of, um, I don't know to what degree the underlying grammar of Western civilization is Christian versus something else, right? I think that's a difficult question. I think that requires a lot of deep scholarly research. Um, so, so I'm not sure, right? I'm not sure to what degree that the, the worldview that, yeah, that is conditioned into me is inherently Christian and I can't escape it even if I wanted to. Like, so I, I, I feel like I've encountered in my life multiple times people who are trying to be Buddhists, who are trying to be, uh, you know, 
Sisiwis who are trying to be whatever, and they're just playing out Christianity. And I see it in our culture right now, right? I, I see, I see that, you know, that paleo is like, you know, I'm gonna use paleo because it's it's less controversial than some other things, but like it's it's the fall, right? It's like we can't eat anything that happened after we left the Garden of Eden, basically. Right? <laughs> like things went bad as soon as we killed the soil. So now we're not gonna eat anything that's killed from the soil. Right. And there's a reason that, you know, in the Black Lives Matter protests, they're washing the, the white people are getting down on their knees and washing the feet of black people. It's like that's that's not sujinaire. It's coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I spoke, uh, I feel like, I don't know, I, I want to hand the mic back to you guys and let you respond. <laughs> no, I, I thought that was excellent. That was very honest. Um, there's a couple points quickly and then the deeper point. One is, I think you put your finger on what conservatism used to mean. Conservatism used to mean the deep appreciation, and I mean that in all three senses of the word, of tradition. And conservatism, is, at least how I see it now in American politics, doesn't mean that anymore. I don't know what it means. I really don't know what it means, right? Uh, right, but I, I, and, and I think that's, that's important, right? Um, to put, um, I, again, uh, I, I think Zizek is right that, um, you know, blaming the West for everything is just, is just inverted racism. We used to be at the center because we were leading everything. Now we're at the center because we're the cause of everything back. It's the same story again. It's like Nietzsche doesn't escape Christianity. He just inverts it, right? And it's like, we got to break out of both this and this, or we're not doing anything. We're not making any real change of significance. We're just redressing things up. And that's the point you're, you're making, uh, uh, Rafe, about all these things that are supposed to be anti-West are just re re recapitulations at the root of the Christian grammar. Um, there's two things that I heard, and this is the deeper point. And then I, I want to hear Paul respond because I think he's actually better uh, disposed. I think I, I feel I might be trespassing on pastoral grounds here. Uh, oh, there's a nice pun in there. Uh, there's a nice <laughs> pun in there. Uh, <laughs> um, anyways, I heard, I heard this deep reverence and appreciation for, the, for Christianity as our cultural father. And I can see why, and, and I can see why that, why, why that's important. But I also, I heard this other thing about like when John 3.16 comes up for you and it, it rings in you in like, I like that, that line from the Psalms, you know, the deep calling to the deep. It rings to the depths of your psyche and to the depths of reality in a way that's not clear to you, but you know, is drawing you, educing, drawing out the original etymology for education and that these two are trying to find a way to come together that's what i'm sort of sensing um and i'm i'm very interested in i mean i'm interested in the in the first because i tried to do a lot of that in the series i tried to do a lot of the recovery of the bones of the father right the first half of awakening from the meaning crisis and of course there's mistakes in there and lacuna but I, I at least tried to give it due, due reference and reverence. But the thing, pardon me? I'm just talking for a second just because I think this is interesting. I'm on the verge of tears and I don't know why. Well, because I, it could be that, yeah. You, your sound's cutting out, Ray. Can you say it again, please? I, I just thought that was worth noting. I, I really have no idea why it's happening, but I think that it's something the, the, that emotion welling up is a signal of something, and I was I just wanted to 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 recognize it as it was happening. Well, well, maybe then, maybe there is there is this. These two are calling to each other, and they're trying to come together. And I'm like I said, I've I've done a, a, I've tried to be helpful on the, on about gathering the bones, and I'm and I, I've I've tried to be helpful in a different way, and I'm very interested about this, like you. you like notice the, the the words we want to use and how careful we have to get. You find the story compelling, but you don't find it compulsive. Do you understand? There's there's a there's now we're on a very nuanced razor's edge. And here I here I'm thinking of Somerset Mom, right? That novel about right enlightenment, the razor's edge, right? The narrow path. We're on the razor's edge here. I'm like I'm very interested in about the way that is compelling to you because 
I think part of it is this, the historical grammar, but I think there's something else. And, and, I, and I don't know what it is, right? Like, you know, we, we put all these words in the spirit is moving me and they're, they're all just like fingers pointing crazily. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I like, again, to go back, I feel the same thing when I'm reading Spinoza and I go from reading Spinoza and to seeing the world spinozistically. It goes from being a predicate to being an adverb on my salient landscape and my sense of identity. Like, and, and, and it draws me, sorry, I, and I, 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 oh, I, I, I feel deep resonance with that. I feel, I feel like that, and how to be, as a non-Christian, how to be appropriately related to you about that. Um, because you and I have a relationship that's very important to me. And um, I'm worried about my own bias. Um, uh, uh, maybe misdirecting you here. So I'm, I'm trying to do this more question. And the fact that I think it's bringing tears to your eyes, this is like a therapeutic thing, right? Like, like there's something in you that's coming up um, in a fundamental way. There's a longing. I think it, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the tears of pain. I think it's the tears of longing. Um, like, like when we hear beautiful music and we long for what it points to, but that we can't fully grasp in the music, that kind of longing. Uh, Schelling said, we are finite creatures always longing for the infinite. Um, and being, and so we're always, we're always horizontal in the sense of being on the horizon, not, not like this, right? And I just, I, I just, I just wonder if, you know, I want to turn things over to Paul, if, you know, what, I want to be helpful without being manipulative. Like what, what, what is, what can be done or how can we help to help you to bring those two together? The way the verse is compelling without compulsive and the way you feel reverence for the grammar of the past, that's like, that's truly fitting where you're at right now. Uh, that's because, first of all, I care about you particularly, but I also care that many people are in your position. You, you're exemplary in a very powerful way, both for people who are outside of Christianity and also for people who get interested in my work who are either in Christianity or considering re-entering Christianity. So I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you in the spotlight, but what you're doing here was so honest and it's so authentic and I think it's deeply pertinent and relevant. Um, and so I wanna, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to be appropriately responsible to those two. And for me, what I think is especially important is how they can come, how they, how they belong together, how they fit together. Interesting. Um, for, for a long time, I used to argue with Christians and my goal was to, to take them out of their Christianity because, yeah. because I thought that it was, it was destructive, right? I, I thought that, that, that religion was the mother of, of human evil. Um, basically, right? Yeah, that, yeah. You know, the, the, the only way to get good people to do bad things is to convince them that God told them to, right? That was, that was the idea. <clears throat> I think that's an absurd idea now, but uh, we, can, we, can, we can dig deep into that. But then over the years, I've, I've come to continue to have discussions, right? Like my, uh, my, uh, my head guy in my business is a, he's a devout Christian. He graduated from Royal Roberts University. Um, right. And we have discussions and I push him really hard because, because I think that what you described earlier of the, of the, the participatory sort of um, trying to extend its domain of the propositional in an inappropriate way. Seems yes. to be, and I'm really, I, I may be being, I may be converting to Christianity on a sort of characterological level. And yet I'm also extremely committed to scientific epistemology. And I, yeah. Yeah. And I, I have not found many Christians who are able to, to, to effectively navigate between those two shores, right? And how we integrate them. And, you know, two things that have actually moved me probably a lot more towards feeling like a Christian, I guess, mm. uh, Peugeot's conversation with Jordan Peterson, where when Peterson asks, like, is it, 
is it faith or is it trust? And Peugeot says it's trust, right? And I don't know if you've seen that, John. I, I would highly recommend I'm it. watching bits and pieces of it. I'm going through it very carefully, very slowly, because I'm going to be talking to Jordan on May 30th. Awesome. Um, that's, these are the topics I largely want to talk to him about. I want to talk to him more about the religious, spiritual topics. Beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, seeing, seeing Jordan's emotion and, and his willingness to be open with his doubt and Peugeot as his friend saying, you can be where I am and you can not, and you, it doesn't have to be a propositional certainty. Um, that probably moved me closer. And then, and then in my first conversation with Paul and I asked him to basically, I, I don't remember how, the, how it came up, but he essentially inverts Pascal's wager, right? <laughs> so yeah. That you did Paul, right? Because you said, rather than say, you know, if I believe and it's not true, then nothing bad happens to me. Um, but if I don't believe and it is true, then I get to spend eternity in hell. Paul flips it around and says, if I devote myself to agape with, with trust, with agape and logos, right? And, and how they are embodied in Christ with trust, that that really happened and he really came and died and suffered for us and went into death and came out of it all for us, that that will help me guide my life the best that it possibly could be guided, whether it is true or not. So I win either way. I was like, whoa, okay. That's another, that's a, that's a, that doesn't, I don't think I've ever heard a Christian articulate the argument for faith that way ever before. And it certainly is a better argument from my perspective. And it's certainly an argument that I believe has much more potential to play nicely with the scientific method and allow us to continue to negotiate the, the, the shores of we have to have science, solid scientific epistemology to be able to actually create things that work in the world. And yet it doesn't, it doesn't tell us what to do with them, right? I mean, it's the same, you know, David Abrams says it in here as well. Like it, you have to have a worldview that, that, that tells you not to use nuclear weapons, <laughs> not just a worldview that tells you how to build them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Paul, you haven't spoken for a while, so I'm, I'm curious to hear what you've got coming out after this. I have just been really loving and enjoying the conversation. And I, I guess two things that come up. I, John, I really loved how you said compelling but not compulsive mm -hmm. because that's my experience in the faith. The, the problem I have with Christians that sort of say, here it is, as if they can sort of lay it out before you like some so like some algorithm that you can go through and achieve the outcome is I've lived in this community and this faith my whole life. And in some ways, you know, Bono's refrain, Bono, who, you know, at least last I knew was identifying as a Christian, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I mean, that ache is, that ache is, I believe, honest Christians will bear testimony to that. And, you know, one of my favorite Christians, C.S. Lewis, bears abundant testimony to that part of. So Lewis wrote The Problem of Pain, which was, you know, in his apologetic phase before he, you know, sort of abandoned it, the formal apologetic phase where he wrote Miracles and the Problem of Pain. Um, he, he wrote that book to try to address, you know, what we talked about, John, that we're going to talk about with JP again, in terms of the problem of pain. Yeah. And he wrote that book. And then much later in his life, of course, he meets Joy David men. Right. There's all kinds of roughness around that kind of that relationship. Um, and then of course she dies and he writes a grief observed and Here's the guy that wrote the problem of pain in which he supposedly had the answer to the problem of pain. And I think it's a profound and helpful book, but he writes a grief observed where in some ways he just throws it all away and yeah. says, you know, 
you know, I, I've, I've devoted my life to this God, you know, where the hell are you? And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know that that grief would feel so much like in some ways abandonment. Mm -hmm. And, but that's of course, exactly my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so, and so Christianity lives in this tension and it always does. And at the end, Lewis, Lewis comes out of it, I think very much where what you articulated earlier, John, in terms of, I am going to lean into God's faithfulness, not in terms of the faith. I mean, faith has become in some Christian circles, a, a, a substitute for knowledge, yada. And that knowledge is, you know, when I know my wife, that's a consummation. And, but, but Christianity is always, you know, faith leaning into and, and what the Christian path, I mean, even after the resurrection, and then even after Pentecost, I'm preaching through this right now in terms of some, I'm walking through it mentally, and we do this every year. You know, we have these arrivals, but you get to the arrival and you realize it's not a final arrival. There's more to come. And, and so on one hand, you could look at that cynically and say, oh, it's all a cheat. He's just leading us on. And okay, well, there's, there's the suspicion. There's the cynic in me that's, that's ah, all a cheat. But at the same time, something that I do know is that all knowing in this world, even deeply satisfying knowing in this world is like that. And, you know, I, you know, I've been married to my wife now, it'll be 33 years this summer. Um, you know, it hasn't always been an easy marriage, as I would probably most people who've been married for over three decades would say. But there, there is always that same dynamic that, you know, my, I, my wife and I regularly look at each other after 33 years and like, do I know you? Yet we know each other probably better than any other two people on the planet. Yet we keep coming to these spaces that, you know, who are you? And, and so I, I get to the point where I say, that's a function of life in this world. Okay. It's a function of life in this world. And I don't think that we escape it. And, and John, I also really appreciate, you know, and, and part of why I think John is in so many ways, I'm so deeply grateful for John as a conversation partner, because I, I, you know, I know, I don't know anybody who is quite so honest and gracious and careful a conversation partner as John is in all of this, because he's so sensitive and he's so appreciative and careful and um, really works harder than anybody I know to play by the rules. Um, and, and so Christianity and pluralism is, you know, there's a group of Christians that want to sort of say Christianity came out of this epistemological clean room, and it's only out of this special revelation. And I, I just think so much of that is dishonest. When I look at the path of Christianity unfolding, it's it's been Christianity bumps up against this other thing, and it wrestles with it, and it finally adapts and moves forward. And in many ways, that's some of the difference between, let's say, Protestantism, which is always deeply adaptive and always flawed too. And, and some of the more ancient traditions that try to say, well, you know, I might talk with Nathan Jacobs, who's a very interesting character. Well, you know, he, he went to the same seminary I did and got a PhD and eventually went to Orthodox, which of course makes everybody at the seminary go like this. But... <laughs> But, but he said, well, well, this is the faith and everything since then has lost it. And I look at it and say, well, that's the, the life is always lived between the antithetical, which is sort of binary. Yes, no, true, false. You, you don't get rid of that in this world, but it's always also the other way too, which is you know, yes and no. <laughs> and it's always between those two things. And, and so I, you know, when I listen to you guys talk and, you know, when I listen to Rafe processing the metanoia that he is, um, that he is reflecting on as he watches himself, you know, I'm, 
I've always been in a process of metanoia. And, and there's never been a day that I've seen myself as outside the Christian camp. Now, some Christians will point at me and say, yeah, Vander Clay's lost. Yeah, okay, fine, have your opinion, I don't care. Um, but that, that metanoia, that, that moving further up and further in is, is what I think you can, you can reliably find among Christians, even very conservative Christians, and I think this is, in fact, what we're made to do. And, and part of why it maps onto meaning the way it does is, you know, this is, this is universal among us. And that's why I can learn. And, and my, my Christian life has been enhanced by John's work. And I know when I first started listening to John and talking about John, a bunch of Christians quite understandably were like, well, the Buddhism thing and the, you know, and the, you know, they were very reactive to John. Well, that's sort of because traditions build in these instincts as sort of self-protective mechanisms. And, but at the same time, you know, when the doctor comes to you with that needle, there's the self-protective mechanism that says, don't stick me with that. Um, but then you have to overcome it and say, okay, stick me with that doctor and I'll trust you that these new fangled vaccines aren't going to turn me into a zombie. So, um, I, I, I'm just, these conversations that we've been having, I mean, part of the reason, you know, I, I always say yes to Rafe is exactly why you said, John, that. I talk to many people who are on this same path, but I say prioritize Rafe partly because of a bunch of other things in his life, but also because he's he's also very good at articulating these yes. things. Yes. And that then, well then, well that then helps others listen to them. And that's, that's why I do these videos. So, Paul, I might get the verse wrong, so please correct me, but doesn't, isn't there a place where St. Paul talks about capturing every good thought for the gospel? That's right. Is, is, that, is, that, is that a correct citation? Well, and, and I was just reading, in our, uh, reading some tweets this morning by a scholar of Abram Kuyper, because the Dutch went through this. I mean, we've been doing this in the West for a while now, and, and even Spinoza, I think, in a lot yeah. of ways. Yeah. You know, you re you look at that story and how things laid out. Um, you know, Abram Kuyper says there's not one square inch of, I'll expand it, of creation of which Jesus doesn't cry, "This is mine." Now that sounds horribly tyrannical to some ears, especially at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. He was a Dutch theologian, became the prime minister of the of the Netherlands. I mean, he's an incredible polymath, but. But part of this point is that Christianity seems to be able to absorb so many other things. And, and the, the difficulty with absorbing things is sometimes the narrative gets lost. And so, you know, for a human being, what we want to do is be able to both take in, but then also not lose the thread. And Christianity has throughout time done this. Now, I also believe that what we're participating in is a story of which every single human lifetime is too short a time frame to actually view. So, you know, when I look at, and we can only see this through history, in Christianity, orthodoxy and heterodoxy, heterodoxy always sort of co-generate. Christianity mm -hmm. doesn't find orthodoxy until a heterodoxy arises and the faith has to sort of process it. I get this from Alistair McGrath's little book on church history called Heresy, where, um, and, and so what's happening now with pluralism is that, okay, the canvas has been enormously expanded. And so Christians like me are like, oh boy, but there are Christians all along the spectrum. There's, there's those who really emphasize the antithesis, those who are deeply conservative, those who will let anything in the door and all along the way it gets processed. And that's what I see happening now. So just to go back, 
do you mind, John, if I, Paul, what I'm, what I'm is, so Christianity has a history of essentially moving into spaces where there are pre-existing religious beliefs and of being able to essentially enter into a dialectic with those and eventually absorb and then somehow remain Christianity. Um, yeah. But it does, it does fracture and it does sometimes lose its, its essence, right? So yeah. Saint, well, yeah. the, the, um, the, the Celtic goddess Bridget becomes Saint Bridget and you know the celtic saints take on the stories and myths of of of, of celtic gods right and the powers of it. <clears throat> and we see this all over the world um and and as we enter this this modern era where you know someone can read the Dave chain and someone can read you know the Buddhist sutras and someone can read the yogic sutras and <clears throat> has access to essentially the, the the religious wisdom of, of, of many different traditions that Christianity has a potential for, for a wide variety of reactions, right? And those are gonna play out. And the correct response in some sense is something that your argument is that none of us are actually big enough to see, right? We can, we can play out our biases, we can make our arguments, but the way that Christianity should respond to Buddhism is a question beyond any of our ability to actually answer fully anyways is that is that a good read yeah. what you're saying there? and it, it and it will it it will likely be answered centuries from now uh you know look at but but then christianity i mean tom holland's take on islam is fascinating in in his you know his book where he tries to get at the the origin story of islam which really annoyed a lot of certain kinds of muslims but his idea was that well, Islam's kind of a, and and Muslims will say, well, we're the we're the perfection of Christianity. Oh, okay, um, and but this is playing out all around us, and and but but so now each of us in our individual lives, you know, we have a certain we have a certain hand of cards that we've been dealt, and we have to all right. This is my hand. I don't live a thousand years ago. I don't live a thousand years from now. I live now. And my parents were these, and my friends are this, and my geography is here. And so how do I manage this? And again, you know, this is where, you know, some of the ongoing conversations we've had with John and Jonathan. Um, I, I really appreciate John's pushback on narrative because, yeah, fair enough. Narratives... Nar nar narratives have issues at the same time narratives are also so powerful they are so powerful and and so and again part of what i really appreciate about appreciate about john's work is well when are we bullshitting ourselves and every time I use that word, I've got certain groups of very conservative Christians. The fact that I said that word, and I'm a minister. Okay. Um, I'm that kind of minister, I suppose. You put me in that category. That's fine. But we, we, we're always living in this mix. And we, but we do, and I think part of what we can find in common here, I think, is a lot of what we've touched on in this video. And, and I, I really love, and I've never read this author before, but again, I really love how you opened it, Rafe, in that, you know, the problem with the way of knowing that doesn't put you into right relationship with the surrounding world. But of course, Christianity believes that, well, it's not just the surrounding world. It's, you know, it's not, not just our sister nature. It includes you know, math. And, and this is, and again, John, your reciprocal broadening and reciprocal narrowing, I've, I've been using that like crazy because Good. if Christianity is true, math has to be better. You know, reason, you know, science has to be more rigorous. I mean, if the, the truth should make everything in the created order more, Hmm. not less. And so then, the, you know, the Christian, I mean, there's been 
uh, so Christianity is growing well every place except where the enlightenment really took hold in some ways. And that's part of the reason I think is that because Christian that comes, I think you said it well, a deep part of the enlightenment is Christianity, but that's Christianity wrestling with itself. And so, um, but now I think the Christianity that I believe we'll see emerge in let's say China a hundred years from now, you know, that'll, we have no idea how what that's going to look like, but that process is happening, and it's often happening in the hands of really fundamentalistic, hardcore, antithetical Christians that say, you know, kill me if you want to, here I am. Oh, okay, and they've got lots of other beliefs in there. Okay, but it's it's all part of the system. There's something that popped in my head that I really want to <clears throat> address, which is. In that I, I'm, I'm somewhat afraid that, that science itself can kind of only exist within the right religious framework. And I see that, um, I think there's no, there's no human institution that can be in, invented that can be proof against the corruption of humanity, right? If individuals do not pursue virtue and do not place truth as a high virtue, truth and love as the highest virtues, then, then everything can be corrupted, including science. And <clears throat> I have an argument with one of my good friends who's a neurobiologist about this, but, but I, it seems to me that there's more and more people within science who treat it instrumentally to their underlying political ideologies, where, where whether something is robust and, you know, um, validated is less important than whether it's directionally correct in their political ideology. <clears throat> and I think that this is an extraordinarily dangerous thing. And I think that it, it points to the problem of a post-truth narrative world. And, and something has to anchor, something has to anchor and get people to, or has to help people transform themselves such that truth is at the center of their moral universe. And <clears throat> you know, this is Nietzsche's critique of Christianity in some senses, that it, it hammered the idea of truth so hard that when the truths that were revealed by the instruments that were created were no longer congruent with their understanding of Christianity, it killed its own, it killed itself, right? Um, but we're, we're still, struggling to stabilize there and 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 this is one of my questions is is there a reason that, that the enlightenment happens within a christian purview is there something about the value structure and the transformation of human beings that happens within that that allows allows science to flourish well and i know christianity has also been antithetical to science at times but and I, I used to be very focused on that, but now I'm like, well, Gregor Mendel is a, is a monk and you know, the church is sponsoring research in all these areas. And, 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 and there's, you know, I, I still need to go back and read all of the alchemy sections within, um, within the maps of meaning because it's a real struggle to get through, but I think there's something really profound there that it's also actually really deeply related to my work. So now I'm getting tangential. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, bring myself back to the point. That's what, when you ask me why Christianity, John, that's actually part of it is because I think, because I am, I'm, I don't think that science itself can stabilize human character in, a, in the direction that it needs to be. And I'm not at all, I'm not at all convinced, or <clears throat> let me, let me frame it this way the signal that it happened within Christianity is important to me. I think that there's evidence there that it's important. And yes, you can imagine counterfactuals, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm conservative, right? I'm conservative in the sense that, that I'm worried that if you destabilize that, you destabilize a structure that, that allows this thing to keep going, so. Okay. 
I'd like to try and, wow, you both have said a lot. And I'll try and pick up on a couple of threads. And I don't mean to disrespect any of the ones that I can't <laughs> return to. Um, I, I, I want to point out first, and it'll lead into other things, that Christianity is not unique in its capacity to absorb and transform. Buddhism goes into China, encounters Taoism, and becomes Chan. It goes into Tibet, right? It encounters the Bon religion and becomes Vajrayana. It goes into Kashmir, becomes Tantra. Then all, then the Chan goes to Japan and morphs into Zen, right? And then the Zen interacts with Heidegger and becomes the Kyoto school, right? So we're like, I don't think that's, uh, sorry, I don't think that's a unique feature to Christianity itself, this ability to do this. I think the, I think that's, but on the other hand, and this is where I'm a plural, pluralist, not a relativist, I think one of the ways we can evaluate religions is their capacity to do just that. Do they have the history, history to do this? Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant to your, your point, and this is where Dewey comes to my mind, right? What I see in exemplified in Christianity and Buddhism is this capacity for self-correcting self-transcendence. That's what we're pointing to. And then Dewey pointed out that we have in the West these two things that are self-correcting, self-transcending systems, democracy and science. And his point was, we have to keep them constantly tightly coupled together because if, if they become uncoupled, right, then one of them will spin off, it'll lose its capacity. And, 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 and then your point seem, if I, if I understand you, is, well, so I think Dewey's right, by the way. I think the, 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 the I, I, we, we know enough from Soviet science and from Chinese science that like if you, if you take, if you separate science from democracy, it suffers. And it's much more liable to be driven by political ideologies the way you criticize, right? Uh, so I think Dewey's got a point, but I take it, Rafe, that you're saying something deeper is that, but there's a common ancestor um, and you can see it <laughs> very much in the Protestant Reformation of uh, the self-correction of science, right? Individual conscience, right? Uh, there's, a, there's a close connection between individual conscience and intellectual, uh, intellectual honesty. Those two closely come together. And of course, the, 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 the church, at least internal to the church is run democratically because of the priesthood of all believers. I hope I'm not trespassing on Luther in any way here. And that, so you've got, you've got a common heritage there. And, and, and then, and, and this is that you have to have, you have to have something like the church uh, as this, all, as this entity. To, and, and then I want to make two points about that, which is the thing about what we're talking about, and this goes back to Paul's point, and this is, is Morton's idea of hyper objects. The, these are things that, right, like, like global warming or evolution that, that aren't located in anyone's, they're not like this. You can't point to the location and say, there's the lump of matter that they are, right? They're multiply realizable, they're bigger, but they're not out there like, you know, the light cone or something. They're, they're into the very guts of our being, you know, global warming is affecting my chemistry, evolution is affecting, right? So it, it, he calls it, they're viscous, they're sticky to us. So hyper objects are, are these kinds of things. Now, an argument that I've been forming with Dan Chappie and the work we're doing about studying how the scientists move the rovers around on Mars, because Mars is a hyper object, right? You can't take a, like you can't get it, right? Is that you actually need distributed cognition in order to process hyper objects, that individuals can't, individual cognition can't do it, right? So how I'm putting this all together is democracy and science actually investigate or, or try to get us into right relationship with hyper objects and therefore they ultimately need sophisticated distributed cognition properly coordinated in order to get us into right relationship because we need that distributed cognition, we need a community. Now, I think that's the structural argument for what you're talking about, that, right, that ultimately if these things, they need each other, but they're because they're in a relationship with hyper and they're both communitary practices. You can't you can't be you you can't be involved in democracy if you're the lone person on an island. Right? You can't do science if you're a lone person on an island. You really can't, right? You can do a little tiny tinkering here and there. Oh, I discovered when when what year is the what what day the bees mate or something like that. Right. But you can't do what we talk, you can't get at the, the core of the universe. So the question that comes to mind is like the historical point. If we if you accept that basic structural argument at least as prima facie legitimate, 
then we can use it to investigate the historical argument and say, well, what is it that in Christianity that you know afforded the communities that gave rise to uh, to democracy on one hand and science on the other? And I think it's pretty clear that, and, and I'm sorry, I don't mean this to be insulting. I, it's because of the Neoplatonism within Christianity. The, the, the Neoplatonism is is that that's ties to the democracy, and it, it gives right. Galileo turns back to Plato to engender the scientific revolution because math is the language of the universe, right? Now, you might say, well, but Christianity gave like a particular ethical nuance to it. I, I don't think that's completely uh, fair to the Neoplatonic heritage either. I think there was tremendous cultivation of wisdom and virtue there. You already had the schools in existence and long standing and running, and they are the progenitors of the monasteries in a lot of ways. I think uh, I got to try to get the pronunciation right. Uh, uh, Augustine is very clear about that, right? Um, now, that's not to diss Christianity, but it's to say, like, are there other instances where the Neoplatonism gave birth to scientific explosion? Yes, within Islam. When there was a huge Neoplatonic revival in Islam, you had the golden age of Islamic science. That's good historical argument and evidence for what I'm claiming right now. Couple, couple of responses to that. <clears throat> so um, it, it's interesting, I was just listening to uh, kind of an argument against Tom Holland's argument, which I, I didn't think was very sophisticated, so I, I won't bother sending it to you guys, but I mean, it comes around to the point that you just made, right? That a lot of the, even the ethics of Christianity are reflected in Stoicism before Christianity arises. But I think here is where um, here's where the power of narrative becomes central, right? Because perhaps these insights exist within Neoplatonism, but you might posit that a story like the story of Christ is actually necessary to create the type of transformation that can move through an entire society, right? that the, the philosophy on its own and those dialectics on their own don't, don't, can't penetrate deeply enough to a wide enough set of people. And John, this is, this is you know, my hesitation about your project. Is that, yeah, yeah, I get it. And it's Paul's yeah. hesitation too. I take it seriously. I yeah. take it seriously. You, you guys know that. I don't, I'm not dismissive of it at all. So, and then, and then, and then I wanted to respond to the Islam thing as well, because one could say Neoplatonism gave, gave rise to, to, this, uh, to a scientific golden age in Islam, but you could also say that it died in Islam and it didn't die in, the, uh, in Christianity. And you might ask why that is. And you might say that we don't know, and I think that's true, potentially. But, but for me as a conservative person, right, um, as someone who has some sort of temperamental conservatism, it's like there's a there's perhaps utility to respecting that historic signal as well, right? Like, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really impressed by Joseph Henrik's argument in, in, uh, in, in The Secret of Su Our Success, and I highly, highly recommend that, but he talks a lot about the idea that there's, a, that, there's <clears throat> that cultures evolve through a Darwinian process, right? Mm -hmm. and they, they compete against each other through allowing certain types of of interactions, you know, like if you want that permeability and that ability to engage in distributed cognition, you want that uh, cognition to be directed in a specific way. Things like rituals, things like, you know, ideologies, things like all these things, those actually have an immense impact on the ability of individuals to effectively do something. And most of it we're blind to and being able to just purely reason our way to seeing it is actually something that uh, there's pretty good evidence we're not very good at, right? And this is one of the problems with, with the utopian projects of communism and fascism and all these things is that they're, they're attempting to, to replace something that evolved through tradition, right? With a purely rational approach to, to something. Yeah. We're trying to solve something purely by thinking it out. And, and <clears throat> I guess my, my response would be something would be more like if we have Christianity, and I mean, this is part of my conversation with Paul, right? It's if we have Christianity and it's Lindy 
and we know that it can play well with science and we know that it can deliver self-transformation um, and it can work within the context that we have, it's pr it might be the better horse to bet on than some totally novel uh, solution or yeah. trying to transplant, say, Buddhism to the West. And I think a lot of very intelligent people tried to transplant Buddhism to the West. And, um, you know, I know you've been in conversation with David Chapman, or at least you've been, you know, looking right. at it. But, yeah. you know, he, yeah, we, yeah. he sees Buddhism in the West as a failed experiment. Um, so does so does Bachelor and Evan Thompson, Stephen Bachelor. Um, he's now after Buddhism. That's a title of his book. And Evan Thompson as well. People I highly respect. Paul and I have talked about this uh, very much. Yeah. I, I, I certainly don't think that the arguments that I've just made are definitive. Part of the argument is that I don't think you can make definitive arguments <laughs> about these kind of things. But if that's the case, then the conservative case might be we should, we should be cautious in trying to disrupt these structures and, and see how much we can build with the things that have been handed down to us, perhaps. Well, uh, maybe I can quickly reply and then open up space for Paul. I mean, back to the historical point, it, it, um, I wanted to emphasize how much the scientific revolution in Europe was dependent on the science and the math coming out of the Islamic world. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a confounded variable. It's not two isolated things that we can then, right? And we have to also take into account the Muslim world is hammered by the Mongol invasion in the way that the West isn't. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of confounding and contingency. Um, so I don't know if that would support sort of a clean argument about, well, you know, I, I, don't think that, I just think that, 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 that there is this historical thing that we have to, to grapple with as well. I, I agree. I agree. And, uh, and I also don't want to deny the fact that Christianity gave a kind of presence to the idea that there's a unified intelligibility. So Neoplatonism strongly argues for there's a unified intelligibility um, to things. And then Christianity gave, by, by sort of situating that in the mind of God or in the being of God, and there was lots of debate about that in Christianity. I won't go into that right now. And it's East and West and blah, 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 right? So I'm not trying to present a homogeneous, as if there's a homogeneous Christianity. I, I can hear people already making comments, right? Okay, so it's like, no, no. But what I'm saying is, but nevertheless, this idea that that guarantee of intelligibility, and I, I'm trying to strengthen your case here, right? This, this guarantee of intelligibility given to us, I'll try to come up with a neutral adjective, philosophically in Neoplatonism, was linked to the assurance we've been talking about earlier on, the, the, the trust, assurance, that perhaps Neoplatonism without the narrative to Auth couldn't give people. I, I, I think that that might be a way to make, I'm trying to make that case for you rather than which I think the historical argument, which I, um, but I then, then I go pluralist and I say, if that's the case, then as long as Neoplatonism is situated in some religious tradition, it has the real potential for science. And this goes back to empirical evidence that my RA, you know, he's he doing, doing his PhD and other, you know, if you, if you compare people cultivating wisdom and virtue, and you compare people in religious traditions to people in a purely secular, the religious people do better. But there's no significant difference between the traditions. Interesting. At least, one, at least one that they haven't been able to test for. Well, yes, to be fair. I mean, so yeah, I, well, Thanks. sorry. I made that sound too uh, presumptuous. I didn't mean to, but but it's also not something you can dismiss. It's right. not something that should right. be ignored, right? And and I'll I'll go a little bit further, and because I'm not, I don't find John's argument about Neoplatonism at all threatening, partly because I, on one hand I have these conversations with some really interesting Jews who <laughs> yeah. who yeah. watch my work, and I've now discovered a whole line of Judaism that basically says, well, Jesus we like. Because if you read Jesus, he's a good Jew. That's that Paul of Tarsus. He yeah. really took it off the rails. So there's that. Very early on with Christianity, you find this in you know, one of the first church fathers like Justin Martyr, 
where sure. Justin Martyr takes, and Sam just, you know, Sam, who you talked to, uh, John. Yeah, really excellent conversation. Conversation about, you know, Justin Martyr very early on sort of says, he's a Samaritan, but he's living in this Greek world. So he's biologically a Samaritan, ethnically a Samaritan, but he's in love with philosophy. So he very quickly says Christianity, Christ and philosophy, they sort of fit together. And so, of course, you know, Jonathan Peugeot's tradition, which is all of this Greek stuff, which, yeah. of course, via a whole myriad of things with Luther, I mean, it's, it's just an enormously complex history. But, but also to make the case that not every place that Christianity went were they able to, you know, manage science well. And so part of what happens in the Protestant Reformation is, you know, because you had, you know, Galileo kind of sort of got crosswise with the church and that that also is a very, people like to portray that as, oh, the church is anti-science. Uh, no, it's, it's that's a not a lot fair. more complex. Yeah. But, but part of what happens in the, in the aftermath of the Protestant Reformation, you know, we don't see, say, Latin America flourishing in the same way as certain so, so the, the story takes on strange permutations all along the way. And, and even today, I mean, I, on, on one hand, to step into the culture war, I'm annoyed at the woke, but I'm also annoyed at the anti-woke because you have to let the sides, you know, you have to, you know, I, I just finished listening to Jordan Peterson's conversation with Russell Brand and, and towards the end of at least the one that's online, you know, Peterson, I thought to his credit says, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe women are pushing against the patriarchy. Um, that's a, and, and maybe they should. And, and that's, I think, the, I, I think you need to let the arguments have their day. And, and what that requires is sort of a, I, I, I've not been able to track down this comment, but Eric Weinstein at one point, I heard him say something where, which was basically like, you know, if you really want to, if you really want to pursue science and just about anything, anything of any importance in this world, I'm probably paraphrasing him terribly, but I'm going to do it anyway, because this is my interpretation. Anything in this world, you need a deep security underneath you that it's going to be okay. And science requires that, just as you said, Rafe, because if you go off in this path of discovery, you might find things you don't want to find that are deeply foundational to, um, to, to these, you know, these things that we live off of and you need a deep security. And so for me, I mean, I, I can't talk about the world. I'll just talk about me. For me, I find a lot of the stuff that we began talking about in this conversation about, um, let's see if my notes aren't the, the, this faith, this faithfulness. And so when I, you know, even this whole, you know, I, I, I live in a fairly conservative confessional denomination and doing thinking out loud on YouTube could potentially, you know, if someone really wanted to come after me, first of all, they got a lot of video to listen to, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, I'm putting it out there and, and someone could say, okay, Vander Clay, we're going to go after your credential. And, and there could be a, a heresy trial. I mean, all of that is a lived reality that I continue to live in. And that might sound strange to a lot of people. Um, but I, there's a deep belief that, um, that my God is faithful and that, that you can sit down, you know, just read the book of Job. I mean, Job starts out sort of coloring within the lines, but as the book continues to unfold, I mean, he's really upset and he's throwing all kinds of stuff out there. And, and the answer that God brings is not, yeah, me and the devil, we have this little bet going on, sort of like in that old movie Trading Places. He basically says to Job, hey, Job, um, really? Do you really know so much? Can you really know so much? And in the end, Job sort of puts his hand over his mouth. And, but, but God isn't upset with Job. And, and so in this tradition, um, you know, it's sort of like I'm a two-year-old and God is the adult. 
and I'm really angry and I'll say, I'll hold my breath. And God's kind of like, well, let's see if he can hold it till he passes out because that's a pretty impressive feat. And, but there's a security that, that I think is necessary for regular human beings to really pursue with, with real intensity and honesty and passion dangerous ideas. And I think you need both in order to actually do this as human beings. And in fact, you also need a community that can tolerate it. And, and I think as Jordan not only talked about in Jordan Peterson, not only talked about in terms of his work, but exemplified in his life, um, this can get scary, but you need a community around you that will say, all right, We'll do it together. And we have that. We have achieved that in certain places in the world right now. And that takes a political reality, a social reality, a psychological reality. It takes a whole world. And in many ways, we're enjoying that. I mean, for John to be able to do what he does as a professor at the university, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, we're afraid that we are afraid we might lose it. Yeah, we might, because it's an astounding achievement. And lots of pieces go into making that. And I think religion is a deep part of it. But again, we are sort of like Job before God with respect to all of these things that are way too big for us to rationally manage. And we should just be deeply grateful that we live at a time where we can play with this and and not be killed. I just want to say one thing that came to mind because I was thinking of um, when Jacob gets renamed as Israel, that one form of continuity of contact is to wrestle with God. And I thought that would be appropriate for Rafe to think about that uh, because of uh, the emphasis he, he's played on how significant rough housing is for proper development of of responsibility and uh, adult agency. And so that metaphor is actually placed sort of very firmly within. D does, the, does the name literally mean something like wrestling with God? Well, that's it how it's identified. Yeah, that's yeah. why yeah. You, you're Israel. You wrestled with God. Right. And I mean. and prevailed. Yes. That's yes. the, I, that, that's a, I mean, you read <laughs> and prevailed. I mean, and this is the Christian God. You wrestled with God and you almost get the sense, again, father, son, that, you know, the father lets the kid win 30% of the time, according to Jordan Peterson's rat illustration, you know, and, and God plays with us. And it's like, take Serious me part. on, yeah. take me on. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Jordan Peterson's made that point of the, the idea of God is something you wrestle with, and that's been deeply meaningful to me. But I would also point out that <clears throat> I think it was Epictetus who said that philosophy is 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 the is the sort of the the embodied is, is wrestling in thought. Yeah, yeah, Epictetus, yeah, definitely said that. Um, oh. And and there's 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 similar allusions in, in Plato. Uh, Plato meant broad shoulder, as you know, he was a wrestler. Yeah, I mean, so this is a, you know this is one of the things that. One of the reasons why I think, you know, John, your, our dialogue has been so fruitful is because I've come to think of it all in play in some sense as the, the reunif reunification of gymnasia with philosophy, right? I think that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant. Like, it's, well, you know, I do. I, I try to promote it. I point to you as an exemplar repeatedly. And I think, you know, um, that, that we need this. We need this, this reintegration. And, and I think... There's, I'm going to try to make a couple of connections because there's something in, in what you said, Paul, that 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 called this up for me, and I, I'm struggling to understand exactly like the the, the meaning of the story for you because you're using a different context or a different uh, viewpoint for me. But but I had this idea recently. I've been on Clubhouse a lot, and there's a lot of rooms where people are sort of discussing the problem of of, of wokeism as a kind of new religion and and how it is it's it's seemingly very authoritarian and tyrannical and, and um, and it's like, how do we respond? <clears throat> and, and I find myself talking about Christianity a lot, which is very surprising to me, um, at least, because 
it, it seems to me that part of what's happening is, is that there's a destabilization that comes from the loss of the church. And, and, and you were talking about the idea that science and democracy, like they have to sort of coexist. And I, I've come to think, you know, like you talk about the idea of opponent processing, right? We need these mm -hmm. opponent processing systems. Mm -hmm. and I think that the church has played an enormously important role as part of that. It stabilizes aspects of individual cultivation that neither science nor democracy do, right? It's like you can't have democracy or science that work well unless you have something that attends to the cultivation of the moral fabric of the individual. And neither science nor democracy actually do that well or should do that well. There's something that has to exist within a society to do that, that, that fits these other things. And you could argue um, that Christianity has failed in some way to do that, at least recently, or that it was never as good as we would like it to be and that we can do something better. And, and I think that, that, that there's truth to that. And, that. and yet also, like I've said from this, from this other perspective, I, I think it's really Lindy and we need, to, we need to harvest the wisdom from it and we need to recognize what was lost. And so the other thing that's come up for me a lot in here in this conversation around pluralism is the idea of Ken Wilber's integral, right? That that we're, we're moving through these levels of development. And one of the things that that does is we, we're, we're always playing in some of the group with in groups and out groups and you know, thesis, antithesis. And can we see the wisdom to be cultivated, right? Can we go there? And, and I, this feels like a very bold claim to me, but what I, what I feel like I'm working toward, what I'd like to work towards, what I think you know, I'm, I'm doing in, in, in collaboration with you, John, and, and, and you, Paul, and other people is, is really, um, integrating the body, obviously, as part of the self-cultivation process. But also, I think that we're talking about integrating, in some sense, and this, you know, this goes right into the awakening from the meaning crisis stuff. We're talking about integrating shamanism, Neoplatonism, right? Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity, and recognizing how they interact. And I think that where, where I think that, say, Paul and Jordan and maybe Peugeot differ from you, John, is that they, they're they open to that integration. And Paul, tell me if I'm wrong here. But they think that you still have to have one centerpiece, one narrative that, is, that, is, that orients us. And they think that, 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 that the best orienting uh, story that we have come up with or that has been given to us, however you look at it, is the Christian story. And I am sort of in between, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Because I can, I can see the religion that is not a religion working very well for me personally. And yet I do have this deep attraction to the story within Christianity. And I, and I, have, a, I have a deep skepticism that we can actually have religion without religion. Right. It seems, you know, when we go to that Lindy concept, it's like, it, does it work that way? I do want religio without dogma, or at least the minimal dogma necessary. <laughs> minimum viable dose of dogma, if that makes sense. So I actually have to go very soon because I have another interview at 11. Um, but I, that was kind of my thesis statement, I guess, of, of where I feel like I'm at in this conversation. I'm curious to, to, um, to get a reflection from, from you guys and what, what that called forth. And then maybe we can get to closing statements and, and come back to it another day. Um, what that called forth for me is, um, I think you're representing things very fairly and accurately. Um, and and honestly, and those are really important. Um, I have said before, and I'll say it again, I have no foreclosure argument on Jonathan Pajot's thesis that Christianity is, is it going to exemplify its ultimate truth of going through a death and resurrection. I, how could I possibly offer a foreclosure? Or, no, that's not going to happen. How could I do that? I, I have, like, come on, that, that just, that would be dishonest and be disrespectful. And I have tremendous respect for Jonathan and for Paul and for JP and for Mary and all the Christians that I regularly and I think lovingly get into uh, discussion with. Um, for me, 
I agree that there, I wanna be clear that I do think there is a center. The question for me, and this is where my discussions with Jordan Hall um, are so uh, powerful and also with Guy Senstock and with Christopher Master Pietro. For me, it is, is the center going to be located conservatively or is it something that's emerging? Um, so is it, are we like in the uh, enlightenment or are we like in the axial revolution? where we're going, we're not reform, we're not doing a reformation uh, that, you know, massive consequences that it had. And so I'm not trying to diss the reformation. Or are we going through an axial revolution where a new kind of center is emerging? And there are other people, people that came out of the Christian tradition like Karen Armstrong, who have argued that it feels, it seems more like um, a new center is emerging, something like the axial revolution. Um, that's not, a, that's not a definitive argument either. And, and when we get to this place, I don't think anybody should pretend to be offering a definitive argument. I'm very afraid of the utopian and fundamentalists who offer definitive arguments. No, it's all in the past, no change it, the fundamentalists. No, the glorious future is inevitable. You know, the utopian. I, 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 both of those have really bad histories, epistemologically and morally. So I, I, I'm clearly, I'm explicitly rejecting both of those. I guess I just think that the Kairos we're in is going through so much change right now. And, and, and I think Jordan Hall's right about that. The rate of change is also increasing um, that we should, I'm, I'll, I'll try to speak as honestly as I can. I'm putting my, I'm putting my bets more on emergence than I am on conservation or on a tradition, not because I'm disrespectful of the tradition. I've made that really clear, but that's how I, that's how I, that's my most intellectually honest answer as to why I take the stance I do. That's beautiful. I, 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 when you said, is the answer in, in cons uh, conservatism or in emergence? I think that that's such that's such a beautiful question, right? Like sometimes the questions are more powerful than the answers. Like always, that. always. Socrates, <laughs> Socrates. No, I, 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 yeah. Um, and I've also made the argument that the speed of change is is really, really an important thing to understand that, that we are having to update culture. You know, I made a very a long form argument with this in a conversation with, with Razib Khan about, you know, the problem of kludging in a in an exponentially increasing technological and economic changing environment. Um, exactly. But um, well, we can discuss that another time. Paul. Or, One thing I just want to put into that, just a note that Sufficient differences of degree become differences of kind. They, if you boil water long enough, you get a phase transition. That's sort of the question that's paramount in my thinking. And that, that was through of our, our last conversation with JP. That was really helpful. Yeah. I, oh, there's so much there. I'll try and be brief. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, um, The Seven Deaths of the Faith. Uh, when I listen to Peugeot talk about resurrection, in some ways he lists, he's lifting a page from Chesterton where Chesterton noted that we see throughout time that this, this path of Christianity keeps resurrecting. It keeps almost dying and resurrecting. Now, like you said, you know, Islam, Islam at the end of the First World War nearly completely died. And, and of course, it had its own resurrection. So, but, but, the, um, but that process, and, and I would say you know, to your conservatism and emergence, things always emerge from the past. And so they're, <laughs> they're both there too. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I would say that each time Christianity sort of, you know, resurrects, I mean, you always have that, that the only way, the only way we recognize that something resurrects is that something is still the same. And I mentioned with J, the conversation with John and JP, you know, my text this past week that I preached on, I didn't really focus on it on a sermon, but in, in the Greek and in, in Hebrew, it's very, and in the Greek and in Luke, it's very clear. It is I myself, you know, mm -hmm. ego, Amy, hotos. It is, it is I myself. And right. they're struggling with that. Um, the other, the other advantage, and, you know, I, I always, I, I really love John and I, I, I cheer him on for his project because I want to see how far he'll get. But I, <laughs> I just, I just always think, oh, John, you're my friend. It's not a, it's it's the, this this challenge that you've taken on yourself is enormous because it's 
it's huge. And, and part of what, you know, in terms of the thread that, that sort of continues to hold Christianity together, as, as all of you know, there are enormous white hot differences in Christianity as in, is almost true of any religious tradition. The, the temperature of conflict within the tradition is almost always hotter than it is even with yeah. people outside of the tradition. Yeah. And so that's true in Christianity too. But this thing that seems to hold it together is, is Jesus. And of course it's Christianity. Um, but, and that's, that's both a, a difficult thing, but an enormously powerful thing because of all the, you know, what, what we're trying to do all the time with these other human beings is, are you in group or out group, in group or out group? And, and so then Jesus, the very name and the word becomes this line, this line of demarcation. But, but it functions as a good line because, of course, the line then bleeds out into the narrative and the story. You can hardly say Jesus without the story. And just this morning, we um, released a conversation between myself and Peugeot and um, Andrea, who is, who is in, who is in um, this community that has formed. And... You know what? It, it, so, so there's this there's this line, and then it bleeds into the line and the narrative. Part of what, part of what I think, part of why narrative is just so successful is that it is, it is so ubiquitously deployed among human beings, mm -hmm. and there's a sense in which not only is whatever faith or system or worldview that I deploy, it is, it is satisfying to the degree that I find is satisfying, but if I can have a community of people around me that it's satisfying to, but not just a community of people around me, which can tend to be quite self-selective. So in our group, we've, you know, my YouTube channel is 90% of the people who watch my YouTube channel are men and of a certain age and of a certain take but what about what about the spouse what about the children what about the grandparents and and yeah. what about geography can i have community with people who don't like philosophy and maybe aren't high in um ability to articulate but maybe have lower iqs and but yet they have lower iqs but tremendously gifted in other areas and and so no religion we have will finally be deeply satisfactory unless it can in fact take in this enormous diversity that we find in human beings if my worldview really plays well with men of a certain age that can read philosophy and have a certain degree of education and have a particular cultural yada, 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 that's always limited when even just within our own homes, we share it with this enormous variety of human beings. And that is the, that has been in many ways, the power of traditional religion. And then the power of Christ and the Christian story, because this narrative just is, we are all employed with this a way of thinking and and that's part of why I think it just continues to work because those are tremendously powerful in terms of finding something that is not only intellectually satisfying, but emotionally satisfying, relationally satisfying, physically sat. I mean, I mean, shakers made furniture and it expressed their faith, but they died because of their, you know, ideas about sex. Um, and, and we see this throughout history. So I guess that maybe is a closing argument that I make. Okay, guys, I definitely don't feel like this is the end of the conversation. Uh, <laughs> has to be the end for now. Um, John, thank you for, um, for reaching out and um, taking an interest in my conversation with Paul and wanting to, to, to. Very much. Uh, obviously play an enormous role in both of our thinking and uh, the way that we're approaching these things. So, <clears throat> so thank you for making this happen. And Paul, it's always good to chat with you. Like, what is this? Multiple times, multiple weeks now. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate both of you guys very much. And I look forward to, to speaking to you again soon. Thank you very much, Ray. And thank you, Paul, as always. Amen. Take, a, take good care, everyone. All right.